Well, we said from the very beginning that aha is that moment when maybe something you didn't know comes into focus. Maybe it's a truth that you had heard before, but maybe you didn't quite understand. It's a teaching. It's something that Jesus taught. You grew up understanding, but then as you've gotten older, you've understood it a bit differently than maybe you have in the, the past. It is the surprising way, really, that Jesus taught his entire ministry. Every story, every event in the life of Jesus has this aha moment. Moment, this surprise moment when he surprises them with something they didn't see coming. If you've not been able to be here over the past eight weeks, I encourage you to go online and listen to those messages. Uh, I, I think they just have some wonderful things that are practical in our lives today. If you remember, our first aha moment came with Peter, James, and John when Jesus took them up on the mountain. We called it the Mount of Transfiguration. It was just really a normal mountain in that day until they get on the top of it and God allows them them to get a glimpse of the glory of Jesus, the glory that he had before he left heaven and came to earth. And it's this wow moment for them when Jesus just glows. It's so wow that there are dead people who are showing up at this moment. Moses and Elijah are there, which maybe should have been an aha moment in and of itself that although physically it looked like they were dead, they were still alive and that none of us are going to actually really die one day. It should have been that aha moment that there is something coming. And Jesus looks and they're talking, it says, about the exodus that is to come. And if you're a student of scripture, when you think about exodus, you think about the exodus that happened. The exodus that was with Moses and leading two million Hebrew slaves out of Egypt. But Jesus says in that moment, we're not talking about that grand event that happened. We're talking about an event that is so much grander, so much more grandiose. It is an exodus that is to come and we want you to be prepared for it. Aha. It happened again when we looked at the man who was let down through the roof. He was carried there by four friends because he was lame and they bring him down right into the very presence of Jesus. They get him there and Jesus says a surprising thing to them. He looks at the man and instead of healing the man, he looks at him and says, your sins be forgiven. And everyone would have been like, what in the world is he doing? They even get in an argument with Jesus, but Jesus sees something that everyone else misses. Jesus is not unaware of the fact that he's lame. Jesus is not unaware of the fact that four people had to carry him there. And Jesus is not unaware of the fact that what he really wants is healing. But Jesus is keenly aware of the fact that what the man needs most is not what the man wants most. And so he looks at the man and he says, your sins are forgiven. And then to prove that he had the power to do that, he went ahead and he healed the man. Jesus knew that that man came wanting Jesus to fix his here and now. And Jesus said, I came to fix your forever. It happened again with Mary. When Mary pours out her life savings, when she goes and she gets what many people believe to be would have been a year's worth of wages. And the week before Jesus is going to be crucified, she breaks it over the top of his head and she lets it run all the way down to his feet. And she begins to wipe his feet with her hair. And then a day in an age when that would have been so out of place for women to do, everyone who is there begins to criticize her. This should have been sold. Something else should have been done. We could have fed the poor with this. We could have done so much more. It's foolish, Mary, to pour out your dowry, to pour out what you're going to live on if you don't have anything else. And Jesus says, let me tell you something. He condemns everybody. He puts everybody in their place except Mary. And he says, she has done a beautiful thing for me. And wherever the story of the gospel of the good news is told, what Mary has done will be told right there beside it. Aha, it's never a waste to pour out your life for Jesus. And Gideon, just a few weeks ago, when Gideon thinks, I've got to have the strongest, I've got to have the mightiest, I mean, I've got to have the biggest army. And Jesus leads him, or God leads him through this adventure that has him going from 32 soldiers down to like 300 soldiers, and they're not even the best of the ones out there. And Gideon has this aha moment when God comes back and says, Gideon, I can do more for you with the worst of what you have, and we can beat the best of what they have. Aha, Gideon. And it happened again in the study that we started last week with the story of the man who was born blind. And the story will suggest that the aha moment is that those who actually see sometimes are the blindest. And Jesus will invite them as well as us to get involved in kingdom causes. 
We said last week that Jesus' ministry was really picking up from the ministry of John the Baptist, that John the Baptist was sent to be a forerunner for Jesus. And John the Baptist is out there in the middle of the desert preaching, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And every time they would have heard repent, they would have known God is about to do something. You need to turn around, you need to change because something's about to happen. And all of a sudden, John begins pointing people to Jesus and saying, Jesus is about to happen. And Jesus says, the kingdom of God is is here. Something is about to happen. And it's going to happen whether or not you want to be a part of it. It's going to happen with or without you, but I want you to be a part of it. So turn around, get your life straight because I'm about to do something amazing in the world. We ended last week with this quote or this bottom line that I don't have to understand everything to do something. I don't have to understand everything to do something. I wonder how many times in my life I've not done anything because maybe I didn't understand it all or or I thought, well, I need to know a little bit more. I need to be a little bit more educated. And I think what this story is trying to say is there are things that you can do even though there are things that you may not quite understand at the time. So let's begin in John chapter nine and we're gonna speed through here. We're really only gonna get to one verse today that we didn't get through last week. And there's like 50 verses in this story. So maybe one year we'll just have 2025. The whole year will be this, the story of the blind man. But I hope it will end at a good place for you today. We're going to pick up in John chapter one. As Jesus was walking along, he saw. If you remember last week, that's where we stopped and said, Jesus saw things that other people missed. We can walk right along and we can walk right past things. But I love the fact that it says Jesus saw what everyone else had missed. He saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or was it because of his parents' sins? The, the, what it really boils down to is this, is they were asking a question, Whose fault is it? Whose fault is it that he was born blind? They had this this belief out there that if you were somehow, if something physically was wrong with you, then something spiritually was wrong with you, that you had done something. And so they say what a lot of us will sometimes say today. Whose fault is it? Whose fault is it that bad happens in the world? Whose fault is it that that there are refugees out there? Whose fault is it that there's human trafficking going on today? That there are still people in oppression? And we can spend months and days talking about whose fault it is. And the tragedy of that question is this, even if you could come up with an answer, even if you could come up with a good answer or the right answer, the tragedy of stopping at that question is this, the people are still lost and and beside the road blind. It doesn't help anyone. And Jesus is saying, there's a real life example right here in front of us. Don't ask whose fault it is because it won't change the fact that he's still beside the road and he's blind. So Jesus gives them a little bit of an aha moment when he begins in chapter three. Well, it's not because of his sins or is it because of his parents' sins? Jesus answered. He says, may I suggest a third option? Maybe this happened so that the glory of God, so that the power of God, some of your translations will say, will be seen in them. And I wonder if Jesus is saying, what if, what if this moment is not so much about what has gone wrong? What if this moment is so much more about what could go right in this man's life? What if this moment was a real life answer to the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray that his kingdom would come on earth like it was in heaven, that you would have the opportunity, that you and I would have the privilege of bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth? What if this was a real life example? of that. He goes on in verse four, we must quickly carry out the task assigned to us by the one who sent us. The night is coming when no one can work, but while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And I wonder if Jesus is saying there, it's time to bring the kingdom in. I mean, we have waited too long. We have, we, too, too much has passed. We've got too many excuses. We're out there talking about whose fault it is that the kingdom of God hasn't come in places. And it's time to quit waiting for a better time to bring the kingdom of God. It's time to quit waiting until we have better opportunities. It's time to quit waiting until we're not so busy. It's time to quit waiting till we've got everything worked out. It's time that we quit waiting for all of our ducks to be in a row. The time is now. People can't wait. Disciples, Tom, the kingdom is here and you don't have to understand everything. You don't have to understand whose fault it is that he's blind to help him. 
You don't have to understand whether it's his parents' sin, whether it's his sin, whether it's no one's sin. You can stop and you right now can bring the kingdom of heaven. You can bring glory to God in what has gone on. So as in other events in the life of Jesus, he does something. And this is the verse we're going to actually land on and probably almost end with. Then verse six, then he, speaking of Jesus, spit on the ground. He made mud with the saliva and he spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. I wasn't allowed to spit when I was a kid. I don't know about you. Uh, my dad coached a little league baseball team and I think that every little leaguer spits. I just think that's what they do. They would spit on the ball, they would spit in their glove and I could hear my mom saying, don't spit, don't spit. It's nasty, don't spit. My dad owned a taxi coat station. Everybody that pumped the gas spit. I don't know what it was, just pump the gas, spit. That's back when they pumped the gas for you. And it was usually men, I don't, I don't know. Maybe there's a doctor in the house. Do men just have more saliva than women and they just gotta get rid of it? I have no idea why it is. It seems to be a man thing that they do. But, but mom would say to us, don't spit, don't do that. But here's Jesus <laughs> and he spits on the ground. And sometimes we try to make it a holy moment. Well, like it was holy spit, it was Jesus spit. I, it was just a, you know, it was just spit. He just like bends on the ground and he spits and he makes mud and I see the humanness of Jesus here and he goes over and he puts it on the blind man's eyes but the blind man is not freaked out because he didn't know what had happened he didn't know what it was coming so he just lets kind of like Jesus put it there without making a face like Ugh, I didn't I didn't know what was happening there and I hope I'm not stretching the story too much but I got a question for you this morning in this verse why spit and why mud why spit and why mud? I mean, if you're the son of God, you could just like do a little dance, you know, like <laughs> dance around, do a little incantation, do a little be healed, touch him on the head, you know, pat him on the back, do something. You could do what he said to the lame man, get up and walk, get on your way, go home, you know, like open your eyes, you can see now. He could have done so many of those things. Why spit and why mud? <laughs> I was thinking all these other great things he could have done and then it dawned on me, maybe he used what he had and maybe his message in the moment. It wasn't that spit could, could heal a man and it wasn't that, that the mud that he made could heal a man, but maybe Jesus was trying to tell him what he, tell the people what he had tried to get across to them so many times is use what you have, use what you have and he looks down and he begins to use what he have and I want, has. And I wonder if it's this teaching moment with his disciples. If it had been today and he would have been a guy, which he was, he would have used duct tape. If he had been, if he had been a woman, he would have used, what would a woman have used? A hot glue gun. I mean, I, isn't that it? Like, what'd you say? Oh, oh, Trent said they still use spit. You know, it'd be spit, mama spit. You're like on the baby. That's what it would be. Like that industrial, like, uh, spit that goes on there. Jesus, he would have used what they had more often than not when I look in scripture and Jesus was wanting to do a miracle in somebody's life. You know what he uses? He uses what they have. And I wonder how many times that we're looking for these great moments in our life to do great things for people. And Jesus says, you know what? You could do a miracle in someone's life if you just use what I already gave you. If you just use what was already out there, I think about the feeding of the 5,000. If you look at Mark chapter six, in fact, all the New Testament writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all talk about it. It was such a big event that every, all four of them mention it in their gospel, that there was a time when, when Jesus and his disciples were teaching, there's such a crowd around them, they begin to get hungry. So Jesus and the disciples get in a boat and try to get away for a little bit. And they get to, I don't know if it's the other side of the lake, Mark just says they get to where they're going, they get off the boat and the crowd has figured out where they are. They've come to the other side and there they are again. It doesn't mention that they got any rest. It doesn't mention that they got that they were able to sleep, that they were to eat. It, it just says they got on the boat. They were trying to do that. But all of a sudden they get to the other side. Jesus looks at the crowd and while the disciples are like, oh man, it's another crowd. It's, it's, an, it's another moment. It says Jesus looked at the crowd and it said he had compassion on them because they were like sheep who did not have a shepherd. And so without eating and without resting and without anything, Jesus just begins to talk with the crowd. 
and he talks from whatever time that was when he landed over there all the way to evening comes. And at the evening time, his disciples come back to him and they say, Jesus, we want you to send the crowd away because we're hungry. We want you to send them away because we know something. They're not going to leave unless you make them leave. And unless, you, unless you whisk us away, bring a helicopter, do something, get, get something and get us out of here because they're hungry and hungry people, they can get a little bit grouchy and we're hungry and maybe we're grouchy and you're going to get hungry and we don't want to make you grouchy. So whatever it is, we just get us away from here so we can eat. And Jesus looks and in, I think it's verse 37 of Mark chapter six, he says an amazing thing. He looks at them and he says, you feed them. You feed them. You feed them. You feed them. <laughs> and I'm thinking, how in the world, what are they going to do? How are they going to do that? Those are the people who are all around. And Jesus looks and he says, this is what I want. I want you to feed them. All four writers tell us, and even John will tell us that Jesus said that, testing them to see what they would do. And then they do what I would do. They begin to panic. <laughs> How am I going to feed all these people? And they, they begin to even tell, you know, nine months wages would not be enough. And we're in a remote place. And even if I sent all the people to the towns and the villages, it would be a while before they got back. One town couldn't feed all of these people. What are we going to do? And Jesus looks to them and he asks them a question that I think is applicable to us today. Do you know what he asked them? What do you have? They look, they want to feed all those people. They want to feed themselves. And Jesus looks back and he says, what do you have? They come back. Andrew is the one that comes back and says, we've got, you know, we've got a few loaves and we've got a few fishes. And Jesus goes like, that's perfect. That's it. That's what we need. What do you have? And I wonder sometimes if the miracle God is wanting to do in our lives, he's looking at us and we're saying, God, we need a miracle. God, I need this. God, I need this. And God is looking back and saying, Tom, what do you have? What have I already given you? What have I put in your possession that you could already be the miracle to someone that you are praying for? It happens again, that New Testament example, it happens again in the Old Testament with Moses. I love the story of Moses. Moses is born a Hebrew slave at a time when it's not good to be born a Hebrew slave or especially to be born a male Hebrew slave because the Pharaoh knows that God is going to send a deliverer. It's been prophesied. And so he makes an edict that all the male babies that are born are going to die. But Moses' mom and dad, Amram and Jochebed, they get a plan together and they hide Moses. And isn't it just like God that the one a baby that the king wants dead actually ends up growing up in the house of the very king who wants him dead. <laughs> and Moses, at a time in his life, he discovers that he's actually not Egyptian. He discovers that his actual heritage is that he is a Hebrew slave. And so in an effort one time to uh, maybe begin to, to free them or to make their oppression a little less uh, hard on them, he takes matters into his own hand and he actually kills an Egyptian soldier. And when he finds out that other people have found out that he does this, Moses runs and he takes off and he runs for 40 years he runs. He gets married, he has kids, and he tries maybe even to forget the land that he's from, to put that all behind him. But God comes to him in a burning bush one day. It's a bush that's on fire, but it's not coming, going up. He comes to Moses and the bush is not being consumed. And Moses at that point has been a shepherd now for 40 years. 40 years Moses has been out there in the desert. 40 years Moses has been tending sheep. And Moses has no idea that there is a day coming when Charlton Heston will play him on national TV. <laughs> Moses has no idea that DreamWorks is about to come up with a movie called The Prince of Egypt and he's going to be called The Prince of Egypt. Moses has no idea that Mariah Carey is going to sing a song to him. So Moses goes, I can't do it. I'm not the man. I mean, surely if he knew all of that was going to happen, he would have been more, more, you know, maybe willing to do what God wanted him to do. But Moses doesn't know any of that. So you get the picture of God coming to him and saying, Moses, I've got a plan for you. I've got something for you to do. And Moses Moses is like, I'm not the guy, I can't do it. And then Moses begins to make all the excuses that we make. He begins to say, you know what? I can't speak well. I'm not the one. Moses finally at some point gets so afraid that as he approaches this bush that's on fire, he gets closer to investigate. And then a voice comes from the bush and it says, Moses, Moses. 
It was probably more like Moses, Moses, but that's not me. So Moses, Moses, and Moses says, I am he. And then Moses, it says, is terrified and he falls down in front of the bush. And the bush looks at him, he says, Moses, you need to take off your sandals because the kind of place you're standing is holy ground. I got a job for you. I want you to go back to Egypt. Moses said, I'm not the one. I tried to go there one day. They, you know, I tried to do it. It didn't work out well. I've been on the run. I don't know your name. You know, I'm not sure how to do this. The king wants to kill me. I've got a wife and kids now. I'm busy. I've got a life. I've been a shepherd for so many years. I can't, I won't, I can't do this thing. You see, Moses gets caught up in the why cycle. Moses gets caught up in the why me cycle. Anybody ever said that? Why me, God? I mean, why do you keep putting that thing on my heart that I can't get out of my mind? Why do you keep bringing that thing back up in front of me? We get caught up in the why me cycle. I'm going to tell you something. If you ever want to hear the voice of God in your life, if you ever want God to use you in a mighty way, at some point in your life, you have to quit using the why me question and you have to go to a different question, which is why not me? Why not me, God? Why not choose me for this task? Why not choose me to do what you want me to do? Why not choose me to change my neighbor's life? Moses gets caught up all in the why me and it's just an endless cycle of questions. And you know what? You'll never know the calling God has when why me is your question. And God in Exodus 3 just lays it all out to Moses and he says, Mo, it's not going to be easy. I mean, you're not going to go in there and he's going to like, okay, you said it, I'm going to let you go. He says, you're going to go and you're going to ask him and it's going to take a mighty hand before he releases the people from Egypt. But I want you to know something, Moses, I will be with you every step of the way. And Moses finally gets to a point where he goes, well, how, how are we going to do it? I mean, how are we going to rescue 400 or 2 million slaves who have been enslaved for 400 years? How are we going to do it? And Jesus or God tells Moses, he says, let me tell you, Moses, this is going to be so epic. It is going to be, I mean, it is the stuff that movies are made of. You think it's going to be like you're going to have two million slaves and they're just going to leave Egypt. Let me tell you, they're going to leave rich. They may be a slave the night before, but they're going to be a rich the day after because I'm going to change the hearts of the Egyptians. And when you leave, you are going to be burdened down because the Egyptians are going to give you their silver. They're going to give you their gold. They're going to give you their cattle. Moses, this is what they're going to do. They're going to pay you to leave this land. They're going to, only God could orchestrate that. And he says, how is it going to happen? And how are we going to do this? And in Exodus 4, verse 2, when Moses is out there, you know, trying to believe God, trying to believe that maybe I am the man, maybe I could do this, maybe, maybe this could happen. God comes to Moses, Exodus 4, 2, when Moses says, finally, how are we going to do that? And you know what God says to Moses? He looks at Moses and he says, Moses, what's in your hand, Moses? I mean, if I'm Moses, I'm wanting some grenades. I'm wanting some tanks. I'm wanting like a 10 million camels running through the desert. I'm wanting some soldiers with spears. I'm wanting some bazookas. I'm wanting something else. And God comes back to Moses and says, Moses, what's in your hand? And Moses is like, this thing, this stick, I got a stick in my hand. God, I picked it up out there in the desert one day. It's a shepherd's staff is what it is. It's got the little hook on it. In fact, on the bottom of it, I've got my kids' initials. I carved them in there one day when I was out there with the fish. It's just a stick. And God says, that's perfect, Moses. It's perfect. It's just what we needed. <laughs> and he takes him and Moses is like, you mean that you and I, that we're going to lead <laughs> two million people out of 400 years of oppression with a stick. <laughs> and God is like, a stick in your hand, Moses, is just a stick. But a stick in my hand can be a power that you can't even dream of. And he looks to the little, to his disciples who are wondering how in the world we're gonna feed all those people. And they are like, all we have is a few loaves and a few fishes. That's not even enough to feed a teenage boy an appetizer. And look how many are out here. <laughs> And he looks and he says, a little boy's lunch in your hand is just a little boy's lunch. But if you give me your little boy's lunch, we will do amazing things with it. Why spit and why mud? 
I think it's because Jesus wanted once again to look at his disciples and to say, the very things you have in front of you, I can use. Want to change the world? Want to make the world a better place? I think Jesus asked us today, what's in your hand? What's in your hand? What have I already blessed you with that you could turn around and you could be a blessing to someone else? If you get to the very end of the story, I'll kind of tell you how it ends. The the religious people, oh, they are so upset. They don't like it because now all the townspeople are turning to the man who was formerly the man born blind, but now he can see. And they're wanting, they're wanting them to glorify God, but they don't believe Jesus is God so that when he gives glory to Jesus, they are mad at him. They want to cast him out. In fact, they drag his parents in. They threaten to cast the parents out of their community. And now they look at him and they say, we're going to cast you out of the community. We're going to do all this stuff. And then verse 24, so for the second time, they called in the man who had been blind and they told him, God should get the glory for this, which was true because we know this man, Jesus, is a sinner, which was not. You see, they just didn't equate Jesus with God and they weren't about to give Jesus any credit for it. And then the guy says something that is so amazing. He says in verse 25, I don't know whether he's a sinner, the man replied. He said, there is so much I don't know. I mean, I don't know where he came from. I don't even know what he looks like. I mean, when he sent me, I didn't even, I mean, put the mud on my eyes and he said, go dip in the river. I haven't even met him yet. I don't know who he is. He just said, go. Do you know that that's a word for you today? Go. How many of you like the word go? Like, do you like that word go? If you just had a word, like, do you, you should like the word go. Men, you should raise your hand right now. I want every man in here to raise your hand that you like the word go. You know how I know you like that? Because you're like me and you think a yellow light means go. That's, I know that. And I say, like to a lady, it means slow down. But to a man, it means go. I'm like, we got to get through this light. I like the word go. He tells this man who he's healed. He says, I'm sending you to the pool that's called sent because I've got a job for you. And you don't have to be the best. You don't have to be the most qualified. All you got to know is one thing, what Jesus did for you. And sometimes we're waiting for the best moment to come along. Sometimes we're waiting to be more educated, to be more qualified qualified to be more something that does it ever bother you that Jesus takes a man who was born blind who has been kind of left behind all his life and he touches his life and he says this is what I got for you I want you to go I'm even sending you to a pool called sent because I'm sending you into the village to tell the people what I've done and the man looks to the religious leaders and he says I don't know all these hard questions I don't know the why I don't know where he came from I don't know what he looks like I don't even know about the Sabbath I don't know if it was the right day I don't know if it was the wrong day. I don't know if it was red mud. I don't know if it was brown mud, but there is one thing I do know that trumps everything I don't know. And it is the very next verse which says this, what I know is this, I once was blind, but now I see. (laughs) That's what I know. Do you know your biggest testimony to the world is probably not going to be the big thing out there? (laughs) Most of us are probably not going to lead 2 million people out of 400 years of Egyptian oppression. But all of us can do something. And maybe the miracle in somebody's life is going to be the thing that you're holding on to that you have right now. Maybe the miracle is going to look a lot like a meal to your neighbor. Maybe the miracle in somebody's life is going to be fostering a child that needed a home, adopting a child that needed a home. Maybe the miracle is going to be your car where you stop and you just pick somebody up and you take them to a doctor's appointment or like somebody I met earlier today who said, I can't get out. And these people, they just stop every week and they pick me up and they bring me here. Maybe the miracle is going to be the home that you think, well, it's not even clean and it doesn't even look right half the time. And there's so many people with better homes and God is going to say, I'm going to take your home and I'm going to use it for the glory of God because I'm going to use what you have to bring the kingdom of God into somebody's life. You want to change the world? What's in your hand? What do you have? And Jesus says, I know something. You may not be able to explain everything to everybody, but you don't have to explain everything and understand everything to do something. Because the greatest testimony you may have is the testimony of what God has already done in your life. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for this story. 
Father, I thank you that you give us these aha moments where we can look and Father, and you just surprise us that the word falls fresh on us every single week that comes. And Father, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for making us a body of people who want to do more, Father, than, than, than just get by and just the status quo. Father, we want to be a group of people who change the world. So Father, would you bring more our way? Would you put more in our hands as we use what you gave us and give Give us to affect the community and the world in which we live. Help us, Father, to be the miracle in someone else's life. And I ask this in the powerful, wonderful, holy name of Jesus. Amen.